Hello, 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 everybody. Welcome back again to another episode of The Dank Hour. I'm super pumped. I have a new microphone set up and I can hear my voice, so I might sound a little bit different today because it's weird hearing myself talk so loud. But regardless of that, we have an awesome episode scheduled and, and coming up for you, as well as a whole bunch of awesome. We got like a, a cannabis geography nerd coming up in, in later days and, and a whole bunch of other neat things. But that being said, it's getting close to Halloween. And I know as the dictator of dialogue and the moderator of meetings, I've totally screwed up my saying, um, that we needed to get a little bit buggy and a little bit weird and a little bit into the interesting part of the thing. Um, so we have with us this week, Matthew Gates. Where is my bloody thing? There you go. Welcome. How's it going, brother? Good to see you. I mean, as usual, like we've we've had you on the show before. You've been on a whole bunch of future cannabis project stuff, but there are new people in the audience. We are always have a growing audience. We always have new people coming on. So for those that don't know you, why don't you give us a little introduce introduction of yourself and maybe tell me like your favorite bug and what, what would be the most interesting bug for you of all time? All right. Yeah, so for those who don't know, my name is Matthew Gates, the founder of Sentinel Consulting. And yeah, I've been working now 13 years in the space. I've worked in other crops as well, not just cannabis. But at this point, if you'd asked me, and I was recently asked by a client, you know, how long you've been in this space and do you only do cannabis? And that's pretty much true now, actually. Uh, the pr Probably halfway through, that became most of the clientele that I work with. And I got into this mostly because there was kind of a dearth of people who were interested in this, um, in, in cannabis or who else, or at least at the very least were willing to be very um, overt about um, talking with growers and things like that. And I had friends who were growers and I've grown too. And so I just thought that that was a, a natural move. I had other life plans at the very beginning of this, but I decided to change those. And I think for the better, uh, now that I've, uh, reaped what I've sowed there, and yeah. So I um I often um, I have a YouTube channel, Zenthanol, Zenthanol here, and you can go to that for a bunch of free information about various pests in cannabis and elsewhere. I actually just uploaded a video that should be actually going online in about five or ten minutes. So don't go, don't click off now. You can watch it later. Um, but I'll be making a lot more videos about pests and plant health and that sort of. And also on my Instagram, Sync Angel, where I think most of my media content is it's a, is a, is a interacted with the most. So I have a lot of uh, exchanges there as well. As well, several of the people on the panel who I've talked to as well. So what's your favorite bug before we before we continue on this very bug brain conversation that we will be having? Yeah, that's, uh, that's always a good one. I think uh, last time somebody asked me that, I was going to say something like a hornet. There's a wasp that was found a little while ago called the, they call it the king of wasps because um, it just looks, and you could probably look it up and, and send a picture for everyone to enjoy. But uh, I forget the Latin name, but it's uh, super gnarly looking. It's got these big gnarled mandibles. It's kind of large. And uh, despite that, you think people would have known about it or at least had it recorded since before now, before recently, I think it was about a few years ago. But yeah, I, I think I like insects that look very alien, very cool, very interesting like that. Um, yeah, basically. It, or something that has a really cool or interesting adaptation. I always find that pretty special. Awesome. So I do have like a, a generalized question here. Um, and I think this might be a kind of a fun way to get things rolling because we're all going into that period of time right now. Either you've harvested, you're planning on harvesting, you know, you, you, it's getting colder, so you might have, okay, Johnny, you're going first, um, uh, or you might have something else going on, uh, whether it's tomatoes, whether you're in California and you got a whole rest of your season left to go before you harvest in December or January. What in this kind of cool down period are things that can really pop up in the garden that become big challenges really, really fast? Because it, it's, it's, especially in the north, northern, northern area where, where you're going to start getting you know, snow or minus temperatures. My understanding is bugs are going to try and find a place to live because otherwise they're going to die or overwinter themselves. So like, what, what do we have to worry about? What are some cautionary things and 
And and what are you hearing a lot of the challenges that come up at this point in the year? Yeah, so in temperate locations. So I, I'm down here in sunny San Diego, right? So we're places that actually have seasons. Things are a little bit different. Um, so big one are a lot of molds. A lot of people are aware of that, that, um, you know, your bud rot pathogens and things like that are often going to increase. Uh, on in addition to that, you have... Uh, insects that might maybe have had multiple life cycles at this time, but then as things get cooler, as the light, the photo period changes and the exposure like that, various insects have interactions where um, they detect that and then that signals to them, oh, I better start to overwinter and they might have various ways of doing that. Uh, many people that I've worked with know that budworms become a big problem they can become a big problem earlier than this, but mostly uh, middle to late summer, moving into autumn, and then maybe even winter, depending on where you're at. Uh, they can be a huge issue. And they will also be, if you don't get them, or for those who are on plants that aren't being cultivated, they the caterpillars will find some soil, they'll burrow into it, and they'll pupate, and their pupation will last a lot longer throughout winter. And then they'll come back up in spring and start the whole process over again and travel great distances to do that. So, but yeah, generally speaking, when I think of autumn, winter, I think of pathogens and things like that, fungal pathogens, especially rather than insects so much. But as things start to get, well, as things keep on being warmer, uh, then uh, those insects and other organisms like them will last a lot longer too which can have a lot of bad implications for people who are expecting kind of a cold reset. So, so my real question is um, something I've been seeing a lot lately going around is this notion that if you have um, extremely healthy plants with high bricks content, that, your plants essentially what is being stated is will not have any pest pressure or will be almost invisible to bugs, which for me, that's like, it's a really optimistic idea um, where I feel like is like, yes, if you have healthy plants, that's going to, you know, maybe be a deterrent or they're going to look else. You know, you're going to have less pest pressure a lot of times. But I, I mean, what are your thoughts on that claim that it's just like, if you have really healthy plants, you're not going to have any bugs ever because people really, that's going around a lot these days. Yeah, it sure is. I've made uh, at least two videos that I can think of specifically on that topic on my channel. Um, like this meme from the face of the earth. I like to put it this way. Bricks, right? The solutes, in, in particular sugar, but also other um, uh, compounds that, that are in plants, for the most part, can't help but help the the, the plant, right? Obviously, because the photosynthate that they produce in photosynthesis is going to be used for all sorts of metabolic processes. So, obviously, that's going to be useful. It can't help, or that's going to help the plant. But yeah, uh, insects are myriad, and there are so many different ones, not only insects, but fungi and bacteria and other sorts of things, not just the parasites, but also the mutualists too. And they also compete, or in other, word, or in other ways, they will um, acquire plant resources as well. Sometimes this is done in a very uh, copacetic fashion, and other times it's actually uh, not as happy as people maybe depict in various models and stories and things like this. So I think that um, high bricks, certainly the claim that you mentioned, where it means that the plants become immune, um, which has a, which usually is very technical, has a very specific definition. The, plant, the insects cannot uh, feed on it or other organisms can't uh, parasitize the plant, I think is um, over-egging the pudding a little bit. But I do think that uh, greater resources are generally better for a plant, but it can also signal that the plant is going to be full of those nutrients that a specialist especially will be able to take advantage of because it's already adapted to those defenses. And I think that people have, um, understandably, 
they don't necessarily understand things like the pathogenesis of these pathogens or the epidemiology of the plant pest interaction and relationship. They, I think that people often have a sort of over simple understanding of how resistance works. It's actually very complicated and we're still learning uh, some of those uh, details. So yeah, that is my opinion. Um, and I, I've definitely offended some people's fifis when it comes to this, this point. I think they hear a charismatic individual say that as long as they, you know, buy my product or as long as you, you know, get a refractometer and you have a high bricks content, you'll be fine. But research doesn't even pan this out. In fact, in some cases, uh, I've read research where um, the reverse is true. Or at least it was more so true. It's either neutral, not not uh, correlated, where bricks is not correlated with insect damage, or it's a little bit anti-correlated, where high bricks actually had more uh, insect presence rather than less, and specifically those that were herbivorous. Fuck those people. Okay. Fuck those assholes. <laughs> you know what? Is the funny <laughs> thing is the people that always the ones that are selling the selling the shit, like even the bricks unit things. Oh well, your plants will be defense. Sorry, I had to cut in there. But fuck those people. Sorry, Johnny. Go ahead. Something that I've noticed in in some of my gardens are that particular plants. You know, if I have you know five different cultivars growing. There seems to be occasionally um, I'll find if there are pests, they have an affinity towards a particular cultivar. Um, have you seen any research about, I mean, I, I'm guessing it's out there on maybe not cannabis, but other plants, insects having like a preference, like a preferential, like aromatic profile or anything like that, where there's a reason a why. A favorite snack. Have, yeah, exactly. They like the grape ape over you know, something like a white widow or something. Most of the research that I've seen on like cannabis plant resistance has mostly been relegated to like powdery mildew, a lot of research in powdery mildew resistance, actually. I, I want to say actually the glut of it has been uh, with powdery mildew specifically, if I'm not wrong, if I'm not recalling incorrectly. With, uh, with other insects though, not, not really as much. Um, basically, well, here's here's one thing I'll say is that like we all think about the various metabolites and uh, a lot of people think terpenes, but as Anna has shared uh, recently uh, and many other as well, um, you know, this is becoming less and less the case. There are many other metabolites to consider. But insects are like powerhouses generally for depressing the immune system in the plant and also for becoming adapted to these compounds. So like, for example, aphids are really good at this. We can get into that a bit, um, but we should probably go through the questions. I should not be so loquacious, but aphids are really good at this because insects as a whole, and also like fungi like powdery mildew, they make so many reproductives and all the ones that don't, that aren't uh, adapted, well, they die. But the ones that do, well, they survive and then they reproduce a whole ton. So in this way, and they often have, they usually have more, they have more reproductive events than plants, than their host does, right? So like, you know, a cannabis plant, you know, how many times per the year does it seed, you know, versus an insect that might have 10 times that, like the budworm moth. And then, yeah, and then you'll get insects that are less uh, adapted to cannabis that maybe Maybe there's more of a likelihood because there's a actually just published a, a, a video on my channel that I was just talking about that goes over CBDA concentrations and how not only has it been shown to be insecticidal for like some caterpillars, uh, might also be the case for other insects too. So that's not really a specific cultivar to your question, but perhaps those who have a higher uh, CB, CBDA content, they might actually be um, more protected from some insects and maybe not others because budworm has no problem with these flowers. Whereas the ones that they were testing, which was the cabbage looper, Trichoplesia uh, was having some, some issues at like one to 0.1% uh, concentration in the diet. So, so I do it think could be that... something like it could be an aromatic profile or a host of other things, even cannabinoids. 
you're saying. It's like it, yes. the reason they have an affinity towards certain, you know, individual plants in a crowd. Interesting. Yeah, absolutely. They might, and they even might be attracted to the things that we consider like that we want, right? So th there might be a bit of a catch 22 there where the compounds that we want might also be attractants rather than being uh, effective defenses. And what might work for one kind of insect might not work for another. So that's the, that's the huge problem in agriculture in general. So you're kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't. Right on. Well, thanks. I got a million more questions, but I got to pass the horn. And, and don't be afraid to get heady as fuck. Like, this is the place. If you're going to take, like, five minutes to answer a question, this is definitely the place to do it. You, you, do you, I, we, we've had much longer answers to questions. I think we've had one show where I think we got a total of three questions in once, and that was a, about the the, the, max, <laughs> the maximum someone could respond to a single thing. All right, next up is Damon. Following that, we got Dr. Cannabis. Hello, Matthew. It's nice to see you again. It's been quite some time since I've talked to you. Um, so in my garden, I use either ladybugs or praying mantis. Uh, the problem that I run into is once the food source is gone, so do the predatory insects. How would I keep them alive without having to like have aphids or, you know, some other insect in the garden, like that food source? You couldn't. It depends. Um, so some predators are going to be very specialized, and if there's no prey and the specific prey that they need, then that's it. That's all they eat, and and they die in nature when that when that's the case. Whereas others might be able to feed on on an alternative food source. Now, one thing that you could do is that you could um, you could create a, a sort of natural enemy reservoir where in which like for lady beetles for example um and there's different kinds of lady beetles out there since i like to mention it there's lady beetles most people think of lady beetles that feed on aphids and that's going to be most of the ones that you encounter like generally in the world but also commercially but also there are like delphastis which go after white fly silverleaf white fly or greenhouse white fly for example and then there's even lady beetles that feed, like Silobora, which I've talked about on this show, that feed on uh, powdery mildew, actually, as, mostly as larvae. So, yeah, uh, there's a whole kind of, there's a whole, like, spectrum of lady beetles out there. But what you could do is you could feed the lady beetles or you could grow plants that um, can host an alternative aphid that doesn't go on the cannabis. You, most aphids are specialists, so... If you have like bird cherry oat aphid, really common, you can feed on like a grass or something in like a cage. Not that you really need it much because it won't go on, on cannabis. It can't. It's not specialized on it. But you can put your other uh, aphid predators or uh, parasitoids in it, in the cage, and they can, maybe they can get out, but the aphids can't get out. Like especially these wasps that are smaller than the aphids. Um, so you can kind of keep it protected also from other aphids that might get in or other predators or in some cases what are called um, hyperparasitoids. So you have you have parasitoid wasps, some people have heard of, that fly around, they insert an egg into an aphid. The egg kills the aphid or the egg develops into a larva that kills the aphid. And then it comes out as a wasp and then it goes and repeats the process. You can even get them commercially, I think a lot of people know. But... One of the things that hampers parasitoid use that a lot of people don't talk about is that you get these other parasitoids of parasitoids, if you can freaking believe it, and they will come in after the aphid has been parasitized and they will parasitize the wasp originally, and then they'll come out and do that again. And so you can quickly have this population actually deplete. And you're wondering, why am I spending these thousands of dollars on aphid wasps when they're not working? When they were working, but they were exposed. So... Maybe you could do that with lady beetles. Perhaps you could do that with, I've definitely done that myself with the wasps. I've also done it with other uh, pests like leaf miner flies and diglyphus wasps, and that worked really well. It also worked really well on Cryptolam Cryptolamus montroseri, which is the um, mealybug destroyer lady beetle. And on mealybugs, it did really well uh, in Gerbera daisies. So. That's something that could be a possibility. Another thing for predatory mites, so like Swirskii and Cucumaris and things like this, they feed on a bunch of 
uh, small insects, but they'll also feed on pollen. So you can go out and you can actually buy like cattail pollen and apply it. And their fecundity goes really high up. In my experience in field observations, they do really good. So I'm a big fan of that if you want to keep them around. Or you can plant banker plants that will have the pepper. I'm sorry, they'll have the pollen. I did a video where peppers, ornamental peppers were used in this fashion. And the research that uh, backed it up, that inspired me to try it out myself and had success, were was looking at ornamental peppers for that purpose. Because the flowers last longer and you have more of them, so you have more sites of pollen. And it's great because the females can gorge themselves on protein, produce a whole bunch of eggs, and then when there's prey, they will actually go after it. Some people, uh, some of which maybe sell mites, are maybe not a big fan of this, and maybe will say things like, well, they'll just feed on the pollen, they won't feed on the prey. That hasn't been my experience, um, but yeah, I think that's there are definitely options for people who know about ecosystem and the ecology of these predators and it can really make um, a lot of economic sense too for commercial growers but also uh, people who want to grow in a garden by themselves the options are definitely there with a little bit of ingenuity which most growers have in abundance you matthew are like we're very lucky to know you thank you that was such a <laughs> thorough explanation and i understood every word you said so thank that, you. that means a lot thank you yeah. yeah no it was awesome thanks for, thanks thanks i, I don't yeah, feel so questions. i i don't feel so bad now that like i can't keep this stuff alive i guess that's a good sign right it's doing its job so yeah yeah and a, a lot of biocontrol is tricky you know it's it's uh and nobody wants to hear it. like clients don't want to hear that when i tell them like oh i'm having all this trouble and it's like well i don't know every place is different but it's true, you know, it's a true statement. And and a big and some of the big pitfalls are in implementation. Uh, sometimes I'll say this, sometimes since you mentioned it, people will get biocontrols and they won't release them immediately. And that's a big no-no. Uh, you almost always have to just use them immediately, even if it's like you know, not an opportune time for yourself. So that's one thing that I think uh, has hurt people in the past. Also quality control. If you get if you get them if you get commercial predators from like a primary source, uh, a lot of the, a lot of the big names out there they're pretty honorable. And if you like have the evidence, and you say like, hey, I bought like 500 sachets of these mites, and I looked, I opened it up, and I looked at it under the microscope, and I saw none of them. They might you know talk with you about it, and they might actually refund or send you another batch or something like that. So. You know, definitely. And if you have any more questions about that kind of thing, you know, hit me up afterwards, Damon. No problem. Thank you, Matthew. Okay, Anna, you're next. Hey, Matthew, it's so awesome to have you back on the show again. I think we've been on like three or four shows before together, and I just really appreciate everything you have to say. First and foremost, I have to say I was messing with a pen writing down notes it leaked i got ink all over my hand so if i have black on my face anywhere whatever i don't care um not yet number, <laughs> number two you know it's really interesting that people somebody on the panel here uh, maybe damon maybe johnny said that they've seen specific plants maybe attract insects aphids specifically more than others i have seen that like we so in colorado uh two adults in the house we were allowed to have 12 plants we did have 12 plants two of them were hemp plants cbd which you're not supposed to grow but they also had tc whatever um but the aphids flocked to the cbd plant and we were like what the fuck so we just moved the cbd plant outside of the greenhouse and we had no problems inside the greenhouse like they just left they just left with that plant and i was like you know what that's fine that's fine so um i if you could talk like i don't know if you can speak to that or not um and that also goes along maybe potentially with terpenes and companion crops we just put some companion crops well we were doing a test in our test house we put some radish 
and I think it was like fuzzy milk vetch or some, I don't know. It was a vetch, um, covered in aphids right now. And I was like, we should probably take this out. Should we take it out of the greenhouse or should we leave it in? Because it is attracting those aphids and all of our hemp plants are just fine. They're not, they're not even being attacked. Um, and then I also, I, I know I'm going to take it keep track of this write this down uh terpenes are they are, in cannabis specifically are they designed or are they present specifically for predator you know especially insects um and herbivore detractants or have we specifically selected them for what we like and really, whatever is secondary is secondary. So I'm sorry, that was a really complex question. Answer whatever bits you want. Uh, I want to I want to answer in reverse order because I want to ask more about the last question. So you're asking like uh, if you get like on vetch or something, right? You had a bunch of aphids, and you're wondering whether to take them out, or leave them in. Yeah. So we. So our we had a grower. He has um, he's he's not they his wife took another job, so he's gone. Oh, but before he left, he planted some stuff, and from what I can figure out, it's radish and vetch, and it's just in like a very small pot, like in our testing, uh, like our R and D, like little tiny greenhouse, and. W before he he didn't really like take note or he didn't give us any he just planted them for fun and we were like what is it and i was like well that's that's a radish and that's a vetch but i was like but they're covered in aphids literally like you flip it out and and thrips as well i believe uh little white little thingies that i can see so i'm like shit this is not good to have them in with our our you know test hemp plants um should we take it out or should we leave them there because they seem to be attracting those insects more the, the the insects are not going to the hemp they're just on these plants so what do you think yeah so like i said earlier with the aphids you might not be having an aphid that's gonna go after the cannabis i think you know in my experience i've come like the big ones that people talk about including myself are like the cannabis aphid Mm. right and the rice root aphid are the two big ones in, in my mind and i've definitely come across like some other generalists pretty sure i've come across um black bean aphid we have had big... aphids on our cannabis yeah. plants before, on our hemp plants before but they seem to not even be these ones seem to not be touching so is it like advised yeah. to leave them as is and let them do what they're doing with the plants that they're attracted to should we put a cover or, you know, some sort of like net over it to kind of like limit their, because as Johnny said, it's getting colder, right? So their food sources are yes. more limited. So I don't know, as the insect guy, what would you suggest? Yeah. Yeah. For like a, for, I think that if you're trying to test for something, I, the pests are obviously going to be a problem, right? For and thrips and thrips. If they're growing or not. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Thrips, you know, um, like a lot of thrips, most thrips are not a problem, but the big ones that people encounter, like the Western flower thrips and that kind of thing, are are uh, super generalists. And could we you know, just that, for that like, let them come to the plant and then annihilate them? Not the plants, but just like this was for research, right? Like, though, well, it not not like official research. Like I'm not actually. Oh, okay, it. okay. Yeah, no, this is like our own personal research. Like we're trying to figure out what grows well in our uh, particular facility and whatnot. So could we just let them come and then spray and then let them come and then spray and then, you know. You could. You could definitely do that. That's valid. Um, if you were really concerned, you could maybe put up an insect screen or something like that. Um, I think what Johnny was saying earlier is it's very apt, uh, basically, as the weather changes yeah, it's true. And for some insects, I think this is going to be more the case than others. But yeah, like thrips are like that too. Like especially in the in like the summertime, uh, especially down here, 
where it's kind of a chaparral sort of location. So like yeah, it gets we hot. Call it, we call it in the forest. So. Yeah. Oh yeah. Exactly. So you're right. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So, but yeah, like all their hosts, all their annual hosts, like dry out or die out or whatever, and then there's a big population and it's looking for food and like <laughs> sim similar. Oh, no. Yeah. Yeah. So it's probably gonna. I mean, at the very beginning, this will probably be the case. And then you're going to have, like, a little Darwin's Island situation. So, like, you'll have all these pockets of greenhouses where they can be transferred, uh, potentially. But Well, when we got to get rid of them, we can't let them, like, thrive in this area and kill off some. And then let the ones that are robust enough to reproduce, like, keep reproducing. Because then we're going to have a real freaking problem, right? If we're just killing off some and not all. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, I think that it's mostly just that they happened to be able to get into the greenhouse. Um, mm -hmm. So at that point, it's really, you know, maybe the stressors of, of life was uh, an influence already. But I think that generally, um, that won't be a problem yet until you get to the point of like, eliminating them through some sort of treatment, whether that's a spray, or biocontrol or whatever. So are you? Um, are, so are if you're you worried about that, you could do multiple different things, like a knockdown really? spray bios after yeah we only have like one little pot of like these uh um uh, radishes and you know whatever is it advisable to plant some more companion crops that these aphids and other insects will flock towards instead of the cannabis or is that like a personal choice like you know whatever you want to do kind of thing like what do you insect guy <laughs> it's super it's super it's super um uh stochastic because some of these insects i think that's going to be less of a, like they said about aphids they're super specialized most of the time so most of the aphids that are feeding on these other companion plants they're not necessarily going to feed on, on whatever your crop is so if it's radishes cannabis or something they might feed on like some you know buckwheat or something that you're applying or whatever that might be you know um, but there are, but like rice root aphid, for example, huge problem in cannabis, um, feeds on all kinds of other plants, especially, uh, like grasses, like barley and rot and rye and rice, obviously. So, and that's like everywhere, <laughs> you know, even if you don't grow it, even if you don't put it out, you know, it's going to be like some kind of a, a weedy plant, in, you know, in the cracks of the sidewalk or something like that. But other, other companion plants, maybe, you know, like, like, depends on what you get but i think the, the 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 crown problem is that i can say all this and then also say that the big ones that people deal with are usually generalists so western flower thrips like you know hundreds of of uh host plants rice root aphid hundreds of host plants two spot spider mite thousands of host plants documented budworm moth you know also yeah. hundreds of, of yeah you know so so yeah I think companion plants is not, I mean, and also I'm always curious because when I ask people what they mean by companion plant, you know, like a banker plant, you have to be intentional with it. That's I think, I think that there's, I think that they have a use case, but you've got to be clear on the use case. Fair enough. And then last thing, and this was asked to me in my PhD defense and somebody asked it in the chat, terpenes, are they for insect defense? Is that why cannabis makes it? so that they can stave off all these insects or in my humble opinion, <laughs> we made it like that, but I'd love to hear your take on this because you're the insect guy. Probably before cannabis was cannabis. I think they probably had some, uh, some terpenes and other compounds. So like, and for those who don't know in the chat and people watching, I think people on the panel know this, but cannabis sativa shares um, uh, sister species is, hop, humulus lupulus, so, and, and um, maybe more than 20 million years ago or so. Uh, I don't know what the, there's been different research that's come out about how old the split is, but essentially they come from, they come from the same ancestor very close uh, in time. So there was a, there was a population of plants and then over time we got what we would call, you know, humulus, that group, 
And then we got the cannabis group as well. And so they're very closely related and probably had terpenes and things like this. They do all kinds of things. They can signal to other organisms, uh, whether as a, as a, as a chiromone or an alimone, you know, that's maybe remains to be seen and maybe is contextual. So some pests will come in and go, Hey, I smell cannabis or I smell this plant that might be suitable. I'm going to come in and check it out. And then you've got predators and parasites of those organisms that might be attracted. And so in that way, it can be a double-edged sword. So like, um, you know, when the, when the lamb bleats, sometimes the shepherd comes, sometimes the wolf comes, right? And so in this cacophony of, of air, of, of fluid medium, right? Or the flies and maggots come. Yes, the exactly. Flies. So you, you don't know what's going to happen. Um, you don't necessarily know. And I think also you make a really good point about what we did. We definitely exacerbated cannabinoid content and other metabolites. I'm, I'm positive of that. And also we, we took cannabis from, from where it expanded to or originated from where it expanded to. And then we moved it to other places and we divorced it from those soils, those, those, um, those ecosystems and things like that. And then perhaps they adapted, sure, but that's not where they're originally from. And a lot of, I think you were probably aware that there's uh, domestication phenotypes and things that we've, because when we were breeding plants in the very beginning before we knew what we were doing on a genetic level and a molecular level, um, you know, there's, there's genes that get, that fall by the wayside compared to their feral cousins or their, rather their wild cousins or their ancestors, they're still out there. And so, and then we integress them back in uh, when we breed in breeding programs, right? So I think that we've probably made some errors without knowing it along the way, especially where it comes to like defense against pests. Thank you. Well, I think I have the next question and, you know, Matthew and I, we've talked a lot about microbes. We've talked a lot about PM. We're talking a lot about insects right now, but I thought I'd go down a slightly different alley before I turn it over to Evian, who has a lot of IPM experience, which I'm more of a microbiologist. I understand micro, but like insects and stuff, they're like crazy. But then you zoom down to a microscopic level and there's microscopic animals like nematodes, which often I see as maybe preventive or beneficial like semi microorganisms microscopic animals what would you say about nematodes i mean from a micro perspective they're used a lot in genetics to like understand what genes contribute to like brain development because they're super super simple tiny little almost like water bears but maybe even simpler than water bears or tardigrades um how can you use them in your garden? Because I see them being like, uh, uh, like prophesized as being good for a lot of different things. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, there's nematodes that are bad for plants, right? There's like root knot nematodes and uh, root lesion nematodes and all kinds of things like that. So but are, like, the ones are some just like... Like, are there good and evil nematodes? Like, tell me more about what, are they different branches? Because, I mean, there's good and bad fungi, too. So, like, are good and bad, it's all relative, right? But um, right. how would you, are they, like, related? Are they just, like, how can you tell friend from foe when it comes to I think, the almighty? I think it's out? not, I think it's not always, um, I don't think it's always as simple as, like, a phylogenetic uh, relationship where um you know the bad guys descend from the bad guy lineage and the good guys descend from the good guy lineage um especially with regards to things like fungi where research has shown that it can be good for us from a cultivation standpoint it can be one or two genes happening happening to be turned on or or, or turned off or, or knocked out altogether uh and and actually I think that the way that I would paint that, I'll get back to nematodes, but I'll just say this, that it's kind of more like um, 
like in the example that I'm thinking of, I made a post about it on Instagram a while ago where this researcher was able to basically, first of all, they knew that the benefit, this beneficial fungus that's often uh, uh, used in, in soils and in cultivation to supplement a plant uh, with, with uh, the benefits as a, as a growth uh, per, uh, helper. I'm not being very articulate there, but basically that's what it's used for. It actually descended from a from a pathogenic lineage originally, and it learned to be more beneficial to the plant. But it did that because it it suddenly stopped to ha stopped having access to the ability to basically rend nutrients destructively from the plant host. So you get rid of that trait with those genes, and suddenly it's a good guy, good guy. But as soon as if it were to develop those that those genes again, or they somehow turned on, then you got the bad guy again. So it's more like somebody roaming and finding a way to get resources, and they, you know, it's not like intentional thing, right? But, the, but going back to nematodes, um, the ones that I'm the most familiar with are the ones that are used for uh, as as like predators, so predatory nematodes like Stenonema felicia and, and those sorts, heterohabditis, that are used to, uh, especially, I love to use them against fungus gnats. They're my favorite biocontrol for fungus gnats. And I think that it's also helpful that you can store them too. So unlike the other biocontrols I was talking about, this is actually something you can put in the fridge and, and should, um, you know, for storage for a little while so you can apply them later on or in, in groups. So yeah, they're good for subterranean pests, but they don't go after everything. And um, I don't know of any examples where I have heard people say uh, that they've used them for things like rice root aphid, but I haven't ever seen any evidence for that myself experientially. And I haven't seen that like met out in research, but if it's there and I've just not seen it because um, I can't be everywhere all the time, but I'd love if someone were to have evidence for that, uh, I'd love to have it shared with me. But uh, generally, mostly for things like uh, sort of worm-like things like fungus gnat larvae, shore fly larvae, um, uh, they're often experimented on with uh, waxworm larvae, uh, which are not usually in the soil. How do they, do they just like, because they're in the soil with the eggs or the larvae, they're like, nom nom, do they directly eat them like how are they do you know the mechanism? oh yeah so they they get in they get in through an orifice of some kind that's also part of the part of the thing is that they're small but if something is really small itself then i think it's a lot harder for them to really recognize it as a target but yeah they get in to the the host let's say it's a fungus gnat and let's say it's a steiner pneuma felciae sf nematode and so they actually release bacteria those bacteria are what kill the, the, the host. And they also release um, other factors that will interfere with other nematodes. So there was this funny research report that I came across where uh, I guess you could say it was like a two birds with one stone situation where the predatory nematodes actually produce like anti-nematode factors because they don't want other nematodes to come in to their host while they're feeding on it and reproducing in it. Um, so they actually produce 
compounds that are against other nematodes that are similar to them, but not the same. So that was kind of interesting. So, and the, so, so those bacteria are very important for them. Those are what are toxic. Those produce toxic compounds and kill the host. And then in this decaying body, it's the perfect environment for them to like feed and, and reproduce. And they're also sexual, or at least they can be. So, so they are trying to attract, so there are males and there are females. And, um, or at least there are those uh, interactions. So not all nematodes are like this, though. There's going to be various different ones. And, and they don't, it seems like also, and this is getting into the nitty gritty, but some of these nematodes or some of these species have like, they seem to have like ambush phenotypes, I think, if I'm remembering right. And some of them are more like hunter-killer phenotypes. So like some of them will like lay, they'll stay until they like sense the chemicals associated with the host and then they'll start getting active and they'll like move towards it, towards the like co the compound gradient. Like a shark who's got blood in the ocean and is like, oh, there's some prey. The other ones um, are just moving around trying to find a host. And that's probably... It's probably uh, selected for depending on whether they live in a place where there's a lot of hosts or not so much. And so biocontrol producers have to consider these things and what phenotype is going to be the best for their commercial grow, uh, grower, right, at the end of the day. So that's interesting to think about, too. This is true for all kinds of biocontrols as well. All these little details that most people aren't aware of. And I think that that's so important to mention because from when you're using a life form to either enhance or inhibit another life form, there's always nuances there. You know, it's not like every human is friends with every dog. You know, those are two species that, I mean, I love dogs, but not every human does. So like there's different, even within the same species, there can be different strains and across really similarly related species, there can be a lot of nuances and changes there. So I think that it's really important to bring that into the equation. And I could probably ask you a million other questions about these bacteria specifically that are associated with nematodes, because I have learned more about nematodes than I have in my genetics class, like maybe close to 20 years ago. <laughs> so I'm going to turn it over to Evian because I know she's got some uh, really cool questions for you. We should link up and do a video on that for sure. Uh, yeah, bugs. And it's so good to see you, uh, Matthew. It's nice. It's been a while. It's been a hot second since the, I think you were joining us for a while on the Breeders Roundtable conversations on Future Cannabis Project. And it was um, some really deep, super nerdy conversations, <laughs> I feel like. So I'm stoked you're here. And I was kind of realizing, I'm like, maybe I should let you pick the question because there's so many different avenues that I'd love to talk to you about. And I think um, there, are, you know, I kind of want to focus on things that are, you know, really useful for people, but I also want to nerd out on stuff. So um, that's my you know, problem hard, too. <laughs> I like to make videos on like this esoterica and people are like, but how does this help me in my garden? And I myself, sir, have this is a Wendy's. Habit. <laughs> yeah, I, I have I have that habit of just kind of totally going esoteric and philosophical about all things related to cannabis. And people are like, OK, what were we talking about again? We just need a scouting IPM program. So, I mean, I would love to actually that was kind of one of the directions I thought about, you know, asking you about the more practical application for people, because I've helped people create um scouting programs and you know done a lot of troubleshooting at facilities when i go into a new facility and i see a lot and i've also seen a lot of interesting trends over the past few years so i like talking about that the other question i kind of wanted to go down the rabbit hole was about it was terpene related but around um trans beta beta farnesine and the uh pheromone AFID alarm release kind of conversation, which I've been deeply fascinated about for years and I've seen a rise in that terpene. So that's another question. And then the other question 
is the one IPM thing that just never ceases to not stump me, which is symphylins, um, because I feel like there's really not very good organic controls for that. And there's some hacks and things. But um, so those were the kind of three different angles. And who knows, we might have time to circle back around. But I just figured I'll let you pick which of those three things sounds the most exciting to you to talk about. <laughs> and then I'll kind of ask the question. It's your own adventure. Uh, yeah, yeah like it's like choose your, choose your own adventure because I could totally nerd out in a bunch of directions. But um, the first one was related to, you know, just basically uh, helping people set up scouting programs and oh, okay. um, IPM programs and like recommendations because I've done that quite a few different times and it's obviously very site specific. But then there's also some really solid basics that people should, you know, be doing to get a solid um scouting program or ipm program kind of up and there's different tactics obviously so that's kind of that question would be directed more in that way and i could get more specific when you choose your own adventure yeah i'll choose all three this i'll i'll, I'll go with the symphilins first uh, i don't really okay. have a lot of options for you okay cool cool symphilins. okay so my symphilins yeah no i don't question. have any options sorry not really okay uh, ooh. The consultant says he doesn't have a response for something, right? For some violence, but if you don't have an for option? some violence, yeah, it's super hard. They're very difficult, and um, I'm I'm very upset that I don't have a lot of good options for people. To be honest, well, could we maybe discuss because, it just a little bit then? Because yeah, it's like I, I would just be because for those of you who don't know, I mean, my question kind of comes from, you know, it's like they can really cause an incredible amount of crop damage and the majority of the time when they show up and also you know kind of back to tessa's question is like we don't really understand what their role is so much in the like agro you know like the ecosphere it's like what exactly do these things do they have weird breeding like their life cycle to me and you're the bug expert so i don't know but to me they seem kind of weird and they the damage that they do is pretty specific and like how if you go into a facility like how would you help people identify that they are some violence how do you check like the population like what what do you what do you know besides the you know solutions part of it because they can cause a ton of damage they're just like they will just kill the plants basically that are there by feeding on the roots and it's you're like what's wrong with these beautiful plants you can't visually see something on the plants so you kind of need to check the rhizosphere right like what's your take what's your take on how just even to assess that it's how bad the problem is well i mean they're so they're subterranean and they go after the roots and so i would say that they are they're organisms that they're actually i don't believe they are actually insects i think they are uh in a different phyla different taxa oh, okay. but regardless but regardless um some phylons are a problem for us because even if you were to fumigate an entire you know soil area you know if you're growing outside an entire field or if you or if you solarize it or something else that's non-chemical, rake it up, till it, you know, other things that have a lot of catastrophic effects down the line that you might not be comfortable with. And a lot of people are not really interested in doing, but even if you were to do those things, those very destructive applications, uh, they'll just come back in. It's kind of the same problem as like uh, jumping worms where it's almost too big of a problem for an individual property. Do you and think so that's because of the deep the migration? Issue. Is it because they migrate so deep into the soil? Yeah. They're not like actually, they go they don't actually go too deep. Not, huh. It's not super deep. It's just that it's uh, very shallow. Uh, but they go after, they can just come back in, you see. Interesting. Yeah, they. So, yeah, I've like, never found something that works for them besides steaming. I mean, we've had to actually replace soil yeah. in complete, yeah. like in bed, raised beds, like having to completely replace soil. And the only thing that we've actually found that has been, because you there's like different drenches or different things you could try to do. Some people try to say like, um, like pyrethrins can be of effect. But ultimately, I think that the one thing that seems like it can possibly work is potentially steaming if it's like raised bed. Yeah, exactly. Like you kind of have to steam them out. But even that is a weird process. So I'm, I'm I, you making me feel better about the fact that there's like not really a solution for this certain thing. So I guess the best way to do it is just 
like don't create a pleasant environment for them. Which I'm not sure. places are, it's going to be worse in some places than others too. Mm. Um, Interesting. You know, so so yeah. And I mean, I guess there are like uh, you know, I see in the comments we have Steve from Potent Ponics mentioning that uh, he's had good uh, good experience with the IPMO. So like uh, so microbial organisms that you might use to, to kill them. And that's something that I could consider being an option. So like with I've had people who've used like Bouveria bassiana and mm -hmm. other sort of entomopathogenic fungi. Now they're not uh, insects, but they are they that these fungi can still infect them possibly. And if you if you were to um, mm -hmm. damage them in some way uh, with some sort of a compound, safe for use of course, uh, but is very uh, toxic to them. And then hit them again with some sort of a microbial inoculant that kills them and reproduces on their bodies. And then perhaps produces spores or some other sort of uh, replicating you know, thing. If it's a bacteria, it could be the same sort of process. But And then have that seeded like, you know, in your soil so that when the, when the symphylans come back or another sort of insect um, that's subterranean, then maybe it'll, it's more likely to get infected. For example, people use the... Um, microsporidian for uh, grasshoppers, which I talked about recently because mm. Colorado was giving a, getting a bunch of them and there's the Nosema microsporidian that's used. And it's mostly used, um, although I guess there are formulations for the adults. You can also, it's mostly for like before they erupt out of the soil. So you're supposed to be trying to get them at that critical point when the females lay the eggs inside the soil and then they're they're developing. And the, the organism comes in and kills them there. So that's a possibility. But I don't know. Like the thing is that from a commercial standpoint or when you're growing, um, you know, in, the, in, a, in a considerable amount of space, then like that might, they might still get damaged, but it might still take time and you might still sustain losses that are not sustainable. So that becomes kind of the issue is that even if you rid yourself of them, even if you were to do the things that I just mentioned, um, from a logistical standpoint, they'll the ones that have not been affected because you can't treat everywhere, right? And they come in from your from from outside of your property back in, and if there's not the same level of the organism that was having the preventative or curative effect, then that could be difficult. Maybe you you start the war all over again, and that might not be sustainable for a lot of people that's just how it is i guess but if anyone has some uh solutions and want to prove me wrong i would love that and so would a lot of other people in north america and various other parts of the world so you know please don't let me uh stop you if you've got the secret sauce you know <laughs> but uh it's a it's it is a problem for a lot of people for a good reason so you know don't feel too harsh on yourself I mean, they seem like they should pop up in, it's like never usually, I mean, obviously knock on wood, but it's not like some giant swath. It'll be like, it'll infect like a, I think sometimes it will come in if there's soil that's brought in. And so I think that's part of the other thing. I think a lot of things in the cannabis industry, I think people aren't really as scrutinizing when they're bringing in inputs from outside of, you know, I've seen all sorts of weird things in cocoa. I've seen weird things in soil being in, brought in. I mean, numerous, like, can't tell you how many pests I think have just ridden in on some sort of soil lot. So I think people could be a little bit more discerning in where they're sourcing those things. Um, but I don't know where we're at timing wise. I know that there's a ton of questions. London I liked your and, other question for aphids. I think I'm going to yeah. just make sure we talk about that one can i can i drive video. it can i drive it in can i can i drive sure, in the yeah. question a little bit more yeah. just because i feel like it's something that so it's an observational question because i've observed over the course of the last five or so years on the west coast that the aphid problem has just increased dramatically especially at scale you just see aphids have increased their predators have increased and something that i observed is that farnesine has also increased in the i look at a lot of different coas for terpene analysis and i see that across the board it has been on this upward trend and i've had people say like oh it's just because we're testing more for 
um, you know, and it's, it's obviously not like a dominant, um, it's a sesquiterpene. So it's a lighter kind of, it's like what gardenia is for those of you who aren't familiar. It's kind of like gardenia or green appleish. Um, it's also in chamomile. Um, and it's got that sweet kind of fruity-ish smell. And I just observed that in this, in COAs with the terpene, like it's, it's, there's been an upswing over the past amount of time as the aphids have gotten worse, the a rise of this and that uh farnesine is it's like the alarm for it's it mirrors or mimics or is the same as the aphid alarm pheromone for when there's like a um for when aphids are i guess um in danger or if there's like an attack on the aphids it's this alarm pheromone that causes them to know that they shouldn't be on those, you know, it shouldn't be there. It's like gives them a sign to not feed or not land or, and I've read, I mean, I think I've read like, I, I don't know, at least a dozen white papers on this because they did studies in peas and other crops to see if it could actually be used as, um, as some sort of application that would deter the aphids from settling. And I've observed that it also causes, and I think this is in some of the papers too, that it causes more um, the offspring. It caught, you know, when aphids sprout wings to migrate, it causes more of that. So my theory was like, maybe this is something that we should be adding in, you know, because a lot of people use certain types of essential oils in their IPM. And so my concept was like, could this be a feasible thing to actually help us that's already naturally derived from cannabis if we could isolate it and then apply it back to the plants? Could it be something that would be beneficial for us? But I don't think a that I've heard other people be like, oh, wasn't that successful in peas? Maybe it's not going to work. But to me, I, I'm curious what your thoughts are. And I'm also curious, like what your thoughts are with things like pheromones as a potential in IPM. So that's kind of the, the multi-layered question. Like what's, what are your thoughts? Yeah. So I'll start off by saying that a lot of products up until recently that are um, marketed as like a repellent, um, not like DEET or something like that with a, with a proven record and all that stuff, but like essential oil repellents and things like that, that's, um, you know, it usually doesn't work very well. And a lot of products that are meant to, this is a concept and in the research I'm sure you've read that this is a concept that people have wanted to exploit for a long period of time. Um, because for obvious reasons, you could maybe attract predators, for example, or you could attract the aphids all to one location and then you could knock them down with a spray and then maybe use less of a spray or something like this. Or maybe you could attract them elsewhere and have no spray. You know, wouldn't that be nice? But there's a lot of reasons why that's difficult to accomplish. And one of them is kind of what we talked about earlier about this cacophony of aromatics in the, in the ether, in the environment where, um, so a, so like, for example, the gradient of compounds is going to have a big effect. And there's even been some research that's critical of some of the interpretations of like the, the signals. Um, if anyone wants to learn more about this, there's a lot of great research on, what's called signal ecology, which is like the ecology of signals, right? It's, it's how organisms communicate with each other, you know, um, you know, uh, some of them, some, some ways that we signal are visual, some ways that we signal are chemical, um, but chemical is the big one that we're talking about here. Aphids, actually the pharnacine that you're talking about, uh, beta, the beta pharnacine, in that research uh, video, I'm talking about the aphid video that I'm going to be publishing soon. I go, I actually talk about this because it's been seen that um, aphids may actually be, uh, maybe they actually co-opted uh, beta farticine in, from plants as an alarm compound. And that actually didn't have, that wasn't their original uh, alarm uh, uh Sorry, I want to say alarm pheromone, but that's kind of antiquated language, but I'm used to saying that because people have said it for so long. I want to set a good example. But yeah, so alarm compounds, right? And so they produce an alarm compound and it causes aphids to do all kinds of things, like change how they're going to lay their, their progeny. 
Uh, they might fall off of a plant. They might start moving away. That's a big one. Because there's some kind of threat and they want to be away from it. And since they're all practically clonal ident uh, identicals, then as long as some of them survive, you know, the colony is fine. So, yeah, so to your point, like, there are plants, and cannabis plants in particular, where this is perhaps more abundant. And I do wonder, and I think there is plausibility, that it could uh, either be an attractant or so maybe even possibly a repellent. But I think that it's it's going to be, it's going to be uh, uh, modified by other compounds that they uh, detect. And since a lot of plants actually produce farnesine and they don't seem to have a problem, I think that it's likely that certain other physiological contingencies or factors are going to be at play, like how hungry essentially the aphid is. So if it's doing its maiden migrant flight, where it might, well, if it is migrating, that's also a, a sort of pernicious misunderstanding about aphids is that they don't always move like thousands of kilometers on the air. They can, and if they do, it's right when they develop their wings and become adults and then fly off. But a lot of times, aphids have what are called, what's called appetitive flight. So they either have migratory flight where they fly very far distances um, and they control some of that with their own wings. And then like, you know, a few meters to a few dozen meters of movement between plants. And the signal compounds like farnesine and other things are going to guide that behavior. If they're very hungry um, or if they have other uh, sort of uh, factors of, from, from their behavior that they take in, like the light, is it daytime or nighttime? Is the wind, you know, above or below like eight kilometers per hour? Which is actually not as fast as people might think. It's actually not very, not very windy. Um but yeah, so that so wind wind that's higher than that is going to delay or make them avoid flight. So all these factors take come into come into play. So I think that far, but to to make a long-winded answer short, there's a lot of factors to con to consider, and I think that aphids probably and different aphids are going to have different responses too. But it seems like a lot of aphids, uh, not universally, but many of them have a similar reaction to farnesine. But I think it has to be at the right level. And I think there might be ways that people can use it to their advantage. But it seems like an easy thing to do would be to just to apply it. But that doesn't seem to work. Otherwise, we'd already be doing it. But it's a really cool thing. I'm really glad that you brought that up. Because I find that kind of uh, fascinating. And I'm also curious why we haven't figured that part out yet. Or to attract predators too. I think that's also a really cool possibility. Yeah, I've always wondered like how people were asking the question and Anna asked earlier, you know, it's like when you're in, especially in like greenhouse or, you know, outdoor production, when you, and even in indoor production, honestly, when you observe the plants and if there are pests, how they really, some plants just seem to get more affected and you have to wonder if it is, you know, the genetics of that plant, if that plant is more susceptible, what the feed was. I mean, there's just all of this, there's such a swarm of data that it could be one thing and it could be another, but I'm really excited. I'm, aphids are one of, for me, my biggest concerns with large scale, uh, you know, just the scale of cannabis that we've been growing, especially on the West Coast over the past however many years, especially since uh, adult use regulation and hemp, it's one of the things that I've just seen such a huge explosion in the population. And it's interesting to watch the the larger population with insects kind of fluctuate and go up and down and it's one it's it's of concern especially when like the agriculture departments are like actually sending out bulletins like hey this is a real problem you need to keep an eye out for this etc cetera, etc cetera. you know it, it makes you curious so i'm always curious about like what bugs are trending and how they're gonna like how we're gonna take care of it so i really appreciate you educating the community on um especially on aphids because i think people don't really take it super seriously so I'm, I'm trying to make more of an effort to do that. Um, yeah. Like, for example, there was a report that came out, actually it came out a few years ago too, but it's still a problem. A green peach aphid, there's a biotype, so like a subpopulation of green peach aphid that uh, people are calling the R phenotype, I guess because it means resistance. Although I haven't actually confirmed why the terminology, but that's usually the case. Um, and it's, it's just screwing up sweet peppers right now in Europe 
and uh, it's, it's very resistant to the com chemical compounds that they use already. And it's also seemingly um, uh, like it's a super specialist on the peppers. So it, it, it uh, reproduces better and, and more virulently. And aphids are the biggest vectors of viruses in, in, in plants. So yeah, that's kind of a problem. And you know, you never know as, as we're growing and I'm sure this is going to be true for cannabis. I don't think that I'm, you know, I don't think it's, it's a low bar for um, clairvoyance for me to say, hey, you know, probably we'll get some resistant or rather we're going to get some uh, specialized or super specialized uh, like aphids, for example, or budworms, for example, because um, they have already been shown to be this way. Uh, different subpopulations that look identical, but genetically are different that like will like be like oh they're like really big on peppers or oh they'll be really big on tobacco or whatever so yeah and i think i think aphids are one of those where that will multiply very quickly as you've probably experienced it's extremely so it's concerning to, to, to me that. it's extremely concerning to me especially with the viruses and that they do vector all of the different things that vector and i think whether we like it or not and no matter how many people try to grow you know, like, you know, like Johnny or people who are growing really, really well in the industry or grow it, trying to do this kind of more uh, polyculture reality. Ultimately, we're monocropping something, even when you're doing these other things. And we're really at this point, I think we all need to have like a, um, you know, a real acceptance that this is real agriculture now and that we're monocropping something and that we have to work together as a community to, to you know, see what the challenges could be. And I think it's really important that we share resources and education because I think that's what other agricultural, um, you know, people have done for years. It's like, if we have a problem, we're going to work on it together as a community. So I appreciate you educating us all on that stuff. So thanks a lot, Matthew. Thanks for answering my questions. And we have what the fuck is that and for the very final section of the episode we have some fun videos and photos that we are going to uh show here and again remember that if a video comes up it will mute your microphone there matthew um just as a heads up i'm going to put it on this one here because it'll make things a little bit easier for you to see and we're going to start with what the fuck is that from peter I do have a second one as well. Scale insect. Maybe brown scale. Not sure. What and so like uh what what's the what's the what's it I see a bunch of ants. Is it so, so is it treated similar like aphids where they can be kind of farmed by ants to get like nectar out and help feed the feed the colony? Like what seemed to be like a very active plant there and what it what would be a, a method of dealing with such a thing because they get very hard once they affix themselves to the to the plan right yeah so when i envisioned my like big everything you want to know about aphid video which i've talked about for the fifth time sorry but uh when i envisioned it i actually wanted to do the three big ones that are related aphids white flies and then scale insects too Actually, if you can believe it, aphids and scale insects are the are more closely related, and white flies are actually less closely related. But scale insects look like scale, and aphids don't. And that's because a very long time ago, the scale uh, female developed this uh, neo neoteny, so they look like their larval form, the crawler form. And I guess the males stayed looking kind of aphid-like. Anyways. Um, so yeah, they both, so that's, I bring that up because they both, all three of them produce honeydew. So they feed on plant sugars. Sugars are the most important thing for them to feed on because they can't make some of the, um, uh, other essential amino acids and things in their bodies. So they rely on bacteria to do that in their bodies. And they also rely on bacteria to do a bunch of other stuff. Some of which actually get produced in honeydew and then other organisms that come in 
are recruited as guards like ants. In fact, there's an example of aphids doping uh, their honeydew with dopamine. And it made the ants a lot more aggressive. So that trait got um, accent, you know, actualized and uh, spread out quite a bit. So there's all these funny little examples of, uh, of guard recruitment in the Hemitera like these. So scale insects are like that too. Basically a female, and you pretty much only see females that look like this. Uh, they will attach themselves. At first they start off as like a little, very small, what they call crawler. And those are highly mobile and they can also get windswept. And, but once they get onto a plant, they usually move a little bit of a distance away from their mother, which they might actually come out by the hundreds. So um, they might be in egg sacs or the female might just reproduce them a bunch and they kind of seep out from their, um, from the bottom of this like case. It looks like that's maybe an armored scale, but it might be a soft scale. Very hard to tell for me, to be honest, from the video. And there's a few tests you can do in the field to find out. Uh, but it can be deceptive. How to defeat them? Well, so ants are not as big of an issue, I would say, in protecting them. I mean, they are against like the parasitoid wasps that you might use and things like that. But to, to be honest, what makes scale really difficult is that they're kind of um, reclusive. So you'll have like one, you'll get the, the crawlers will get onto your plants from like the air or something. And then you don't notice it because they're very small. And then over like the span of months, they'll find some little crevasse or underneath a leaf or something, and they'll eke out an existence. They'll become adults in a few months, and they'll start to reproduce. And then a few months after that, you start to get a larger colony. So at this point, it's like half a year of time has passed, maybe, or more. And then suddenly there's a whole bunch of scale because they were in some like little place where they try to stay kind of hidden. Um, at least a lot of times that's what happens to people. So the, bis the biggest thing you can do is crop scout. And I didn't get to maybe my favorite question uh, that Evian had, which was about how to set up a crop scout um, system. It's very important, probably the most important aspect of IPM in my opinion. And I'm very surprised that so many times when people ask me for help professionally, I ask them, what's your scouting protocol? They don't really have one. And yeah, so just take it from me. That's something you probably want to do. I can help you with that, but there's a lot of other resources that can help you with that too. So, you know, some way, shape or form, you should find a way to do that. And so to deal with the scales in particular, I'm a big fan of uh, using something like Bouveria bassiana because the fungus can just get right through their cuticle and it kills them. And because they're usually very clustered, kind of like aphids and whitefly, the fungus will... Um, it'll spread very easily between the, the cluster. And so I, I really like that for that reason. You can also use things like pyrethrin, for example, not permethrin, not pyrethroids, pyrethrin. Very low toxicity to mammals, except for cats. So if you have cats, you know, beware when you're applying it. And it quickly breaks down in the presence of light and water, which you're probably going to have in abundance. In the and so, and that breaks down to compounds you also don't really but it's a natural compound. A lot of people are aware of it. Uh, it's also very insecticidal against things like aphids and scale insects. But um, I will say that it can really depend on the kind of scale that you've got. Identification is, is helpful and important. But you don't always know what you're dealing with. So, yeah, good uh, good video, good, good example. I, I, I got another. I point. got another two that we can try and go through. A little. time here i see a wasp so peter's labeled this one wasp caterpillar yard so it looks like this wasp is devouring the caterpillar is this something that we should be should we are wasps not a terrible thing because i fucking hate wasps i mean the little tiny ones that yeah. don't really matter don't matter but this is uh, both of them are just terrible. and everyone in the chat like you can see you can see all the panelists like now like aching out in the background it's pretty hilarious yeah, I mean, so this is this looks like a paper wasp, so like Polistes genus, something like that. And um, battling on, I think that they're great. They're the attack helicopters of the insect world. They love to kill caterpillars, and that's why I like uh, wasps as well. 
Yeah. So, so I feel like, so paper wasps and other wasps like that are, are great. They love to carve up uh, caterpillars. I've, I've watched and shared videos where they basically find one, they cut off the head because it's basically this chitinized hardened shell. They cut off the head, they gut it like a hunter would a boar or something. And then they carry off the proteinaceous bits and chunks to give to their larvae. So the larvae need protein and, and fat to develop. And then once they're adults, they may they mainly just have a sugar diet, or maybe it's a little bit of protein too. But like the sugar, which keeps them going, it gives them enough uh, uh, resources to beat their wings and fly great distances. So yeah, so wasps they need caterpillars. A lot of times, caterpillars are a big part of their diet, unless and these are social wasps I'm talking about. There's obviously like specids that go after spiders and other sorts of things, but. Yeah, wasps are good um, if, you know, but some of them are invasive and some of them are aggressive. But paper wasps like these, they're pretty docile, to be honest. So if you can avoid not killing them or if you're not somebody who's very uh, sensitive to uh, wasp or bee venom, because there are people out there who are. And you, if you don't know, you don't know. But um, yeah, so generally speaking, I'd say that they're a boon and, and not a detriment. OK, last video. And there's a photo. That's the photo. And again, this is what the fuck is that? Um, <laughs> uh, what what do we? I have no idea what I'm looking at here. I don't know for sure. And that's the thing with this. Looks like a fungus. And I, if I were to guess, I think that might be like sclerotinia. Which uh, sclerotinia scleroturum or whatever. Um, it's becoming more recognized as a pest in cannabis. I mostly say because the the mycelium matches a little bit with what I see, what I've seen in like pictures, and what I've seen in person. But fungi are difficult, you know. If, if like here's a here's a tip: if someone sees like a really generalistic picture of something, some like white fuzz, and they go, "Oh, I know for sure it's this." You know, interrogate them a little. Ask them how they know that because it can be hard to identify things from pictures and videos, right? Yeah. So, but uh, the reason why I'm more confident here, I'll I'll explain, is that it's the it's the the my, this like bubbly, like almost like molten kind of like weird mycelium, um, which I kind of associate with the mycelium of Sclerotiorum. But it could be a different sclerotinia species. It could be something that just looks similar in the same family. Uh, who knows? But uh, it's definitely uh, it does it does keep in with that morphology. And it's a it's a common bud rot pathogen actually. And uh, Chad Westport was in the chat uh, earlier mentioning that on the FCPO2 channel we have tons of. Um, uh, videos. I have a big bug bud rot video, and I go over this fungus in particular. So if you want to learn more, you can check it out at the FCPO2 channel on the uh, Xenthanol Pest Primer series. Awesome. Do, does the microbiologist want to want to pop in too? Does she wanna... No, I mean, yeah. so I'm like, uh, I I totally agree. It's very hard to tell, and that's one thing that's. Uh, you know, even when I explain to my students when I'm teaching micro, like, you know, plants and animals, they have like feathers with different colors and like real clear characteristics. So when you look at it, you're like, that's a red winged blackbird or that's a, um, you know, an oak tree. But with molds and stuff, it's really, really, really tough. So I would I would definitely second like a grayish white mold it's really tough to tell, but as Matthew was saying, if it's got some characteristic morphologies like these bumps, which this one does look a little bit different than other like molds that will just cover and like decay something. 
Um, and like where it is on the plant is also really important where like some things like botrytis might more target the flowers. There might be other parts like the stalk or the leaves that other microorganisms attack and some are just generalists and do everything. So yeah, always send that out for sequencing or try to culture it and really, uh, try to identify what that is. Yeah, absolutely. As you can see, I said that it's often a bud rot pathogen so it often rots the the inflorescence but here we see it probably if i am right exploiting a the wound a wound or something which is super common and a lot of these bud rot pathogens are systemic so they might get in through the roots or might get in through a branch or through a or the stem and then it travels up and it can be really destructive super quickly and it's this a is very never quick like thing. a good sign right if you see something yeah like no <laughs> A bug yeah. or a fungus. It's like Last of Us when like they're sprouting spores yeah. out their head. You're like, this isn't a good thing, right? Yeah, like, get rid of it. Yes, yes, yes. Get rid of it. Not a good guy. Yeah, yeah. I want to play what the fuck is that like all the time. Like this game is really fun, by the way. And I'm all about like IPM bingo and what the fuck is that? Like this is super fun. Right. I would be I would be down for doing this more regularly for sure. Totally. I want to do, I want, we can just bring on our, like, uh, IPM experts too, and, and all just everybody in general, but like, this, is, this could be really fun. You IPM taste bingo. It. Yeah, totally. I'm like, I love this game. London, you already made a graphic. <laughs> Yeah, man, fly making the graphics in the background. I, next time I'll have it be able to do like in a little sound thing or some shit. Uh, but anyways, with that being said, we are seven minutes past the time. It was been a hell of an episode. I'm sorry, I got like like over 10, 12, over twelve questions asked in the um in in the in the back that we did not get to. So my sincerest apologies for those of, of you that have have awesome and amazing questions because there are some phenomenal ones. But we will be back next week or what, what week is it? Is twenty fifth next week? We will be away next week. Um, but after that, we will be back again. Um, to have a lot more fun here on the Dank Hour. With that being said, we will see you all next time here on the Dank Hour and have a wonderful evening, y'all. Where's it? Bye. Bye.